Aquarius, this is Charlie Bolden. How do you read? Administrator Charlie Bolden. This is Donnie Metcalf Lindenberger. I read you loud and clear. <laughs> Ah, oh, don't be so formal there, Daddy. How, how are you and Tim doing? How are you and Tim doing? Well, Charlie, we've been enjoying a most magnificent week here at the, the Aquarius Habitat, 47 feet below sea level. Um, this is Timothy Peak from the European Space Agency. And I just want to take a moment. Uh, this week has been really special. Well, it's been about 12 days. And uh, we've always shared a quote, and my quote earlier this week was from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And 50 years ago, Scott Carpenter flew in space as the second American to circle the world. And three years later, he lived 28 days at the sea lab. He is the first American, well, the first person to be an astronaut and an aquanaut. He blazed a trail that has led many, including myself, to live both in space and below the ocean. And I just wanted to say that I am honored to have had a chance to follow in his trail. But this would not at all have been possible without an amazing team. And that's something else that we've been talking a lot about the last few days. So while Tim and I are outside here and our habitat technician, James Talasek, is outside with us, <laughs> inside the habitat, around our table, you will find my other team members. We have Steve Squires from Cornell. We have Kimia Yui from the Japanese Space Agency, and we have Justin Brown, who is our other habitat technician. And they'll show you also at their table, and they're looking out the window, but they, you can probably see from the camera inside the habitat. The rest of the team that's been topside, that has supported us either at the Mobile Mission Control Center or supported us with divers, or brought in the Liberty Star and helped us splash submersibles, or provided us with all of our daily tools. That is the whole team that has pulled off Nemo 16. So it's just been a real honor to be here, and I'd like to turn it over to you to ask some questions. Hey, Daddy, I don't know whether I have any questions or not. You know, you, it's a great introduction to your whole team there, and I'm glad you gave me an opportunity uh, to go inside uh, Aquarius, because I was going to ask you how Steve was doing. Y you know, we let him go from his chairmanship of the of the NASA Advisory Committee Council for uh, for just a little while to do this work. So hopefully he's pulling his share of the load up there. Oh my goodness, I can't tell you how much it has been a pleasure to work with. Steve. <laughs> I was a high school teacher back in Vancouver, Washington, and when Spirit and Opportunity reached Mars, and I watched Steve's team cheer with excitement, and uh, he has shared so much about what Spirit and Opportunity have been able to do, and before we came down to the habitat, Opportunity was finding new information out about uh, deposits on Mars, and Steve was sharing that with us. And I think that he would agree that today was maybe one of his favorite days, although his favorite days have, of course, been with the submersibles because we have done some great science off of the submersibles. But uh, today we had an opportunity to explore using a lot of the different tools. We have our jet pack. We have translation lines. We have all these different ways to collect science. And uh, he really led us today with that. So thanks for sharing him with us and letting him get a little bit away from his uh, regular job. Well, good. Hey, Tim, I, you know, I know um, you're down there, and this is your, your first uh, experience doing this kind of stuff. And I understand you all have been really learning a lot about translation, about using tools and the like that, that we may be using when we go to an asteroid. Um, you know, do you, how have you found the ability to get around down there compared to, say, your ability to get around in a 1G environment of Earth? 
That's right, Administrator Willis. It's been an absolute privilege to be involved in this it's mission. Sorry, Tim. And for the first... <laughs> for, <laughs> I, I'm really glad that the, uh, the European Space Agency is, uh, is sending astronauts now to take part in NEMO, and long may that continue. It's been a fantastic mission, and as I say, a real privilege to be here. And uh, the translation techniques that we've been using have been uh, really eye-opening. In fact, just this, just this afternoon, Dottie and myself were really challenging ourselves, not by taking necessarily the easiest or most efficient route, but by doing some other strange things using translation lines and booms with our jetpacks, using jetpacks to carry booms from point A to point B, and actually deploying our own translation line over these asteroid surfaces. Uh, to, to try out those methods, and we've had a fantastic mission, we've accomplished all of the objectives, and we've really collected a load of great data, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of that data, and to uh, seeing what the fruits of our labor will produce in the years to come, and it's just tremendously exciting to be involved in a project that is dealing with man's next space exploration mission beyond low Earth orbit is tremendous. Fantastic. Hey, Dottie, I know, you know, I know this is the second mission uh, on NEMO where we've looked at, at uh, visiting an asteroid. If you go back to your experience on board uh, shuttle and, and roaming around station, um, how do you find that, that life on Aquarius compares, or does it? Oh, it reminds me of both places that I have had a chance to be at. Of course, uh, like the shuttle missions that you before that you flew, you know that being on a shuttle mission is surely a sprint. The moment you launch to the moment you land, you are go, go, go. And uh, over these last few days, we have been go, go, go from 6 o'clock in the morning till late at night. But uh, it's just such a pleasure to do all that work. So that part compares with the shuttle. But the inside of this habitat, which is about the size of a school bus, is like being on a small international space station. And uh, we, at a week of training leading up to this, we were taught about the redundant systems. And uh, just a couple nights ago, we experienced those re redundant systems when uh, one of the the AC power went down, and folks came out and uh -huh. got the other AC power going, and uh, that was because we had a storm going on. We have sea swell here, and uh, it reminded me a lot about the space station with all of our power redundancies, our ways to provide oxygen to scrub the carbon dioxide. Um, so there's so many good comparisons between both uh, places that I've had a chance to visit. Fantastic. Hey, hey Tim, uh, you know, I, I understand that, that they're introducing a 50-second or some, some time lag in communication such that there's a significant time between when someone communicates with you all and when you actually hear it and then going back the other way. Uh, was it very difficult to adjust to that at first or, or have you adjusted? You've been down there 10 days now. Is it, is it still difficult getting used to communicating that way with such a significant time lag? It's been really interesting with the, the, the time delay. We've kind of fallen into a good routine, and we've actually adopted text messaging with Mission Control for routine ops, and that tends to work really well. Um, and the voice delay is not too much of a problem during normal operations. But what was interesting is when we were, uh, when we introduced some simulated emergency scenarios, and I think that's where we felt. So the 50 second time delay and even greater time delays that we uh, simulated had, a, had an effect and that's something that we'll clearly need to address. Um, and, but it was very interesting to be, uh, to be involved in those emergency scenarios. We've also had the 50 to second delay for our friends and family and for things like uh, internet browsing, etc. And uh, I haven't found that too much of a problem, actually, using today's social media, instant messaging, video messaging, etc. It hasn't had as big an impact as I thought it was going to. So really, I think it's just a voice communication in off-nominal situations. 
fantastic. Hey, Dottie, you know, you, you started out by talking about um, uh, your nostalgia, uh, remembering back to, to when Scott Carpenter and John Glenn were the first two Americans to orbit Earth and, and uh, saluting Scott. But, um, you know, today, I understand, is the 40th anniversary of Title IX, which uh, was the act that actually made it possible for women to to uh, more in energetically get into the fields of science and engineering by actually entering those fields of study in, in colleges and universities. Most people think about it all the time with respect to athletics, but it also opened new avenues for women. You're an incredible role model for my three granddaughters, and um, hopefully they're going to they're gonna watch this uh, as we replay it, and, and maybe one at least one of them will want to be where you are today when they grow up. Well, I, uh, I have to say that I am very glad that Title IX came along. And, uh, you know, my mom was a mathematician, and I grew up just knowing mm -hmm. that because of her strengths that um, I was interested in math and science. And I know that she had had to face some struggles, but uh, thankfully, in my generation, I was able to study science and, and never have to deal with those, uh, face those same struggles. And I was able to be an athlete in college and run on both the cross country and track team and compete there. And my daughter, who is just now five and is probably also watching with your granddaughter, believes that she can do whatever she wants and knows no boundaries. And I am so proud of her. And I'm so thankful for all that led before. So uh, I, uh, I'm really glad that all those people took risks, you know. Again, uh, thinking back, like I said, with the nostalgia to before, the world continues to change. We change because we help each other. We're an international community, and uh, we are all different people that bring different strengths to the table. And uh, this is all possible because we believe in our own dreams. So thanks for bringing that up. Oh, great. Hey, you know, and I know you all need to get back to work, but um, can the folk in the lab, uh, can they, I know they can hear me, but can they talk, Steve, or uh, can any of them talk in there to me? I don't know if they're mic'd up. Are they mic'd up in there? No, they're not mic'd up. But Probably they're, not. Uh, they're waving okay, at don't, us. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> they I'm, I see they them can't waving. Speak. So, great. That, you know that's all right. <laughs> hey, I was. Um, I, I know, I do, I do. Hey, uh, hey, Tim, final question I have for you is, you know, now that you've been through this stuff for 10 days, I know you got, you're coming home on Friday, but or coming to the surface on Friday. Um, does what you've been doing for all this period of time, does it, based on what you imagined a mission to an asteroid would be like, uh, since we haven't done that yet, do you see, you see this training as realistic? Is it, is it something that, that you find beneficial and, and uh, add some realism to your, your thoughts about what it will really be like when you get to go to an asteroid? It's, it's been an incredibly realistic mission, yes, absolutely. Um, I was lucky enough to do a, a caves mission uh, last September with the European Space Agency, and that was a, what I thought at the time was a good analog for the space flight, but I don't think you can beat Aquarius and what we've been doing down here as far as the space analog is concerned. It's the next best thing to, uh, to actually going into to space. Uh, I would imagine being down here and isolated as a crew, working together for a long period of time, being able to do the neutral buoyancy tasks that we've done, and also being involved with uh, the submersibles and having the ability to bring, you know, big pieces of machinery down here, deep worker submersibles, working with real rocks, real sediments. It's been a fantastic simulation scenario and uh, a tremendous mission. And uh, I think I have gained a huge amount. I've learned a lot about myself and I've learned a lot about my, my crewmates. We've had a great time, got on really well. <laughs> And it's yeah. just been a, a tremendous experience all around, one that I, I will treasure and I will learn an awful lot from and, and hopefully take that forward into my space mission. Well, I, I tell you, um, I just think it's tremendous, this international crew, crew we have up there, down there, I started to say up there. Uh, Camille there, I know you can't answer. Uh, you in the, in the module and Steve, 
representing Cornell University very well. Dottie and Tim, uh, thanks so much for letting me intrude upon your time down there. And uh, I'll let you go back to work right now. But, but thanks so much for sharing your time with us and, and sharing your experiences with, uh, with the, hopefully the public around the world who will have an opportunity to see this. Well, like I said, Charlie, it has been a real pleasure speaking with you, and thanks so much for coming down and talking with us today through the airwaves. Fantastic. I look forward to getting there for real one of these days. You, you would love it. It's fantastic. <laughs> Okay, well, this is, this is Charlie Bolden in, in Washington, D.C. out. So thanks very much, uh, Houston, for all of you for hooking, hooking this up.